Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Mental Architecture, Building the Mind, One Moment at a Time. Thank you for joining me for my weekly video series. Today, I'm going to talk about a matter of perspective, just to show how your perspective on something may actually change what the object that you're looking at is. It really brings in the question, what are objects? Are they a figment of our imagination? Are they really out there? Or maybe something in between. So I'd like to start out our discussion on perspective by thinking about something from art called Impressionism. So Impressionism is a style of painting that artists back in the 18th century would use very commonly to paint something or portray something in a very subjective sort of way. And so two artists might look at the same scene but paint it in two different ways. And it, it would be hard to tell really what exactly happened. And so one good example of this is the painting La Grenier. I'm not really that great with French, but that is basically a resting area in Paris, France, that both Claude Monet and August Renoir, uh, Pierre August Renoir painted. And they painted two vastly different scenes. So I want you to take a moment and look at the two paintings. Let's first look, look at Renoir's painting, and then we'll look at Monet's. So if you look at Renoir's painting, it's, it's a lot more lively, um, very social, brighter colors, more focus on the people, and there's a sense of kind of being immersed in this environment with uh, everybody present. And you can see kind of like how kind of happy and reflective this, this painting looks. And if you look at this in contrast to the one by Monet, there's a huge contrast. Monet's painting makes things seem kind of like a little more detached as if um, Monet was like not a part of this, not a part of the, the scenery and instead it was taking a step back colors are a little more dreary and it just doesn't look like it was as crowded as Renoir made it seem. Now, they both painted the same scene at the same time, yet came out with two very different perspectives on what happened. And so that really raises the question about, well, what really did happen that day? Everybody has a different interpretation of what's going on when they're in a social scene. Renoir chose to focus on the more social aspects of that day and also to indicate a more welcoming attitude and environment, whereas, Ren whereas Monet made it seem a lot more detached and like he felt maybe a little bit out of place. So I don't think we could say for certainty what happened that day. If you were to go back in time and ask the other people who were present what happened, they would all tell you different things. Or if they were all to paint pictures of the scene, they would all most certainly paint different scenes, even if they were just as skilled as Renoir and Monet, which we know they probably weren't. So this brings up an interesting matter about the importance of perspective. And I want to share a quote with you. This quote is from author G.E. Moore. And he said, there are two beliefs in which almost all philosophers and almost all ordinary people are agreed. Almost everyone believes that he and what he directly perceives do not constitute the whole of reality. He believes that something other than himself and what he directly perceives exists or is real. So people naturally want to believe that whatever they see is what must be reality. And I mean, to a certain extent, that is true. You can only be 100% certain of your own existence. You can never be certain of the existence of people or objects around you. So of course, what you see is real. But if it's viewed from another perspective, and that perspective is also valid, then wouldn't it also be true that that person's observations are equally real to yours? If you're in a room with 50 to 100 different people, and each of those people sees something different, who sees what's really there? And so we really can start to get into the weeds with this and go beyond just social settings and get into physical objects and kind of bring this full circle to object recognition. There really is, ironically, no objective way to look at objects. And I'll start with just a really simple example. I want to show you a picture of a golf ball. Then I'm going to show you another picture of a golf ball. And another picture of a golf ball. That's three different pictures of a golf ball. What makes a golf ball a golf ball? Golf balls have these little white ridges around their spherical shape. And they're like these, there's indentations that are there for a purpose. 
And at what point does a golf ball cease to be a golf ball? Does it cease to be a golf ball after it's been hit thousands of times and deformed? Which is pretty hard to do with a golf ball, easier to do with something like a tennis ball. What if you took a golf ball and you dropped it in lava? The golf ball disintegrates, it becomes part of the lava. So is it a golf ball anymore? At what point does that ball stop being a ball and become something else? Now see, this gets really complicated because separating an object from its environment is almost an illusion of the brain. The brain creates the boundaries. The brain creates the shapes, the textures that tell you that this object is separate from its environment, but that object is always part of its environment. In fact, the environment is probably the only thing we can be sure of that ever is actually there, if that's even there, because all our realities are slightly different. But the golf ball is only a golf ball as long as we all agree that it is one. The moment enough people disagree about it being a golf ball, it turns into something else. Like if you stuck dynamite underneath a golf ball and it exploded into like shrapnel, I don't think you could argue at the moment of explosion that that's a golf ball anymore. It's something else. And there's two other things that make it really difficult to properly identify objects. More than two things, but two major things. Another one is the distance you are away from an object when you're observing it. So in my book, I talk about an oak tree. I think everybody knows when I say oak tree, they can look in your head, you think in your head, you know what an oak tree is, you could look it up online. When you think of an oak tree, how far away are you standing from it? How far away do you need to be to call it an oak tree? You could be six feet away from it, it definitely looks like an oak tree. Now, what if you go 300 feet away from it and you just see a little dot in the distance? Well, you knew it was an oak tree when you first saw it, but if you were looking from that far away, you might not even know what it is. And what if you were literally standing right up against it, staring right at the bark? Is that still an oak tree? What perspective is the correct perspective to look at a tree? The, the tree's properties don't necessarily change the further away or the closer up you get to it. But the distance away that, that you are away from an object is an interesting one because objects look different when they're viewed from different angles and perspectives. Another thing that's interesting is at what point does the tree begin and at what point does it end? From a distance, this really isn't that difficult. You could just say, well, there's the tree, here's the top of it, there's the bottom, you know, the branches, the stump. But when you're up close, you see how the tree is just constantly changing. All objects are in a state of constant change, even if they're imperceptible. Leaves fall off the tree, branches break off, bark falls off, and it goes to the ground. So at what point does that tree stay a tree? Kind of like the golf ball problem. If the tree burns up in a fire, it's no longer a tree. If the leaves fall off, if like, 10 or 12 leaves fall off the tree, it's not the same tree that it was before. It's slightly different, it has some different properties. There's also a whole ecosystem inside the tree. Does the tree end at the ground? Does it end where the, where the roots end? Does it end in the sky where the branches and the leaves end? What is it that makes that tree a tree and separates it from its environment? It's actually really not an easy question to answer when you consider that the tree came from the ground and eventually returns to the ground when it gets old and it dies or it burns down in a fire or, or whatever else. So that again, these are labels that we put on objects. We call a tree a tree because we recognize the properties it has in that moment, but that, those properties could change at any time and it really could become something different. It's no different than you. The viewer watching this video, you are a different person with every passing microsecond. Cells in your body die, new ones are born. Every seven years, enough cells in your body's change to where you're pretty much a brand new person. There's no way to go back in time and recover the four-year-old version of yourself. The four-year-old version of yourself isn't there anymore. In fact, the version of yourself that was there before you watched this video isn't there anymore either. It's you're in a constant state of change. 
you like to think of your personality and your character traits and your look and your brain tricks you into thinking it's very stable because these changes happen very slowly. It's like when you shave and your skin feels really smooth and then a day later there's a little tiny bit of hair and more hair and more hair. You don't really perceive these changes. You don't sit at yourself and look in the mirror and watch your hair grow or your fingernails grow. That's really boring. But these changes happen just like they happen to the tree and you, you have parts of you that fall off and die. Um, fingernails fall off and die. You know, fingernails aren't really living to begin with, although they do, they, they are formed from dead skin cells. Um, you have hairs that fall off your head and fall to the ground. If somebody else picks those hairs up on their socks, are you a part of that person? Where are you? We like to think of our brain as us, but what about your eyes, your nose, your lips? Where's the center of you? At what point do you begin and do you end? When skin cells fall off into the, into the air and become dust, is that dust you? So even defining the boundaries of you as an individual, it's really tricky. In fact, it's almost an illusion to even think that you are an individual. You are just as connected with your environment, both physically, mentally, and spiritually as a tree is connected with its environment. The properties that make you up and the properties that make a tree up and the fact that you wouldn't define yourself as a tree and define a tree as you, pretty obvious, but there's a lot of gray areas. Like if, you're, if enough of your skin cells come off and go onto the tree or if a piece of bark ends up on you know, your feet and gets stuck in your shoes, is that a part of you? Is that now you? Do not easy questions to answer. I just want to revisit the topic of measurement again. Come back to the tree. Let's say we want to know what the height of that tree was. First of all, what's the correct distance from which to measure the tree? Do you want to measure the tree really up close and start at the very base and go to the top? Or do you want to maybe stand a few feet back and measure it? Depending on where you decide to measure it from, not just the measuring device. We already talked about measuring devices in the previous section. But where do you measure something? Or do you go right up to the bark? Even if you're right up to the bark, you're still missing little grooves and edges. There's like so many of them that you won't catch. It's just become so difficult. What if you're a hundred feet away? Is that a valid measurement of the tree? Where is the tree located? Is it really located anywhere? Or is it just located somewhere from your perspective? This it's, it's Thoughts like these that kind of drive me crazy and, and are behind the reason why I even wrote this book in the first place. It is your mental architecture that decides, first of all, that that's a tree, and secondly, where that tree is, third, how to even measure it. So I wanna leave you with a quote from one of my favorite authors. Um, this is from Lewis Carroll, who wrote Alice in Wonderland. If I had a world of my own, everything would be nonsense. Nothing would be what it is, because everything would be what it isn't. And contrary-wise, what is, it wouldn't be. And what it wouldn't be, it would. You see? So I want to also read the quote that I have in my book that I wrote after that. In a sense, everyone is their own Alice, trying to make sense out of the world around them, using labels from other people's imaginations to identify objects, animals, and other material things. If everyone were to come up with unique labels, forms of measurement, and ways of identifying objects, then each person's world would be completely different from another. So if every single person in the world, I want you just to think about this for a second, were to all call a tree something different, there would be no tree except to the person who calls it a tree. It would be something to everybody else. And this actually kind of bridges very nicely into my next chapter, No Normal which my next video will cover. These are, No Normal is the most popular chapter in my book, the one that people talk about the most. I think you're really gonna like the videos in that section. But we know that different cultures view things differently. And we don't just have diversity in things like skin color and age and, and those more superficial things, but there's diversity even in the way people label objects and the, way, and the way people refer to objects. And I feel like we need to be sensitive to that. Not everybody views things the same way. And so it's really helpful to learn different languages and about different cultures and how their circumstances, their histories shaped the way that they view the world. And who's to say 
whose view is the correct one. My argument is they all are correct. As long as people are striving to tell the truth, as long as people are doing their very best to recall what really happened, then you can't argue that their version of history is any more or less valid than somebody else's. It's only when lies get thrown in and people make things up that their versions of things would be maybe less valid. But even lies and truth, there's a big fine line there too. Somebody's truth is what they observed. It's what they agreed on that this must have been what happened. You know, even the most honest person is still going to tell little lies here and there. It just gets very tricky. But coming back to the main point of this entire chapter, there is no perspective that is the correct one. Everybody's perspectives are equally correct. Your thoughts matter. Your thoughts shape the world. Your thoughts shape the people around you. You matter. And so I'll leave that. I'll close there. Thank you so much for watching another video of Mental Architecture. I hope you enjoyed this one. Please be sure to like, subscribe, and comment below. And I look forward to coming back to you next week. We're done with chapter four. We're going to be starting chapter five, which is no normal. And I'm really looking forward to bringing you videos in that one. So thank you, everybody. Have a great day.